is pleasing to him. I have given. I have given. Let's go to Joshua chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Joshua chapter 6, starting at verse 1. going to be reading out of the King James Version. Everyone remember the promise that God told Israel, told the children of Israel that he would usher them into the promised land. Here they are at Jericho. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, I have given into thy hand Jericho. And the king thereof and the mighty men of valor I'm going to pause right there. I'm going to go down to verse 5, but I'm going to go through to verse 5. But notice the God past tense. This is something that I've already done. All of the promises of God are already sealed. That's what Jesus Christ died for over 2,000 years ago. The promises of God are yea and amen. He already has given us. He depicts everything that was in their inheritance. He gives them an itemized list. He says, the mighty men of valor. But then in verse 3, it says, And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thou shalt do six days, and the seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh Day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priest shall blow with trumpets. And it shall come to pass when the when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and all and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. There's two parts to this. God says, I have given, but sometimes people stop at the have given and forget how he's going to orchestrate it. Still talking about trusting God. There are some things that God has given to us, but then how do I obtain it? Notice that there was instructions from God on how to obtain what he had already given. Some people miss that. Whether it's a calling or a gift or something that God has told you to do, we still need instruction from him on how to do it. He, had, he says in verse 1, he says, I have given you. Excuse me, verse 2, and the Lord said, I have given into thy hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. But wait, Joshua, before you go about obtaining it, let me give you instruction. Because if I go about getting what God has already given me in the wrong manner, then I won't, I won't obtain what it is that he has for me. Amen. Are you willing to move in faith on what he promised? The first step, however, is to identify what he has promised to you. Most people don't know what God has already promised them. It's in the word of God. Study to show thyselves approved. We have to make ourselves literate to the promises of God. Sometimes it's as simple as receiving. As my sister was talking about when she was praying for someone, she told her, just receive. See, sometimes the enemy will have you to think that you have to jump through hoops in order to get something. Now the work was already done by Jesus Christ. But then there's a manner in which I have to understand how I obtain it. And usually it's just a matter of receiving. 
Because when we add some steps that we think are necessary without consulting God, then now we try to make it like it's something that we're doing. Well, I did this and you know, the Lord blessed me and I, and I did such and such and then he blessed me over here and I did, oh, you put an eye in that. That's a little bit of pride in that, brother. Did God, did you do something or God just give you something? I like what Paul said. Why do you act as if what you received, you didn't receive it? Why you act like you did something? Why you act like it was your faith? We, we want to put an emphasis on faith sometimes. And faith sometimes can be an opportunity to be puffed up. Yep. He said, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's very, very small. A mustard seed in contrast to a mountain. He said, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. So faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I like what the, 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 uh, uh, the disciples said one time, Lord, help my unbelief. Right. Jesus, you said a hard thing, help my unbelief. That's not, a, that's not a, 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 a contradictory prayer to God. That's being honest with God in your relationship and saying, Lord, help my unbelief. There's some things that I believe. And if we, if we be honest, there are some areas that we trust God a little bit more than. And then there's some other areas that we're not so trusting in God. Yeah. It's like muscles. Yeah. You ever see them guys, they, they swole, but they standing on 11 o'clock? Some of y'all will get it. <laughs> Big as a house, but standing on 11 o'clock. They're deficient in one area. Now, if you get them on that weight bench, boy, they pushing. Get them over there and do some legs. Get them to do some squats. They'll buckle underneath the pressure. That's how they are in the spirit. God wants us to be well-rounded in our strength and our faith. First, again, what has he given me? What belongs to me? And I'm going to give you a little bit more than that. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because a lot of times what happens is, because we don't understand what God has given us, our fight is not the same with the same intensity. I'll give an example. If your daddy gave you a coat, and that coat was worth just say $4,000. You got diamonds or whatever on it, or maybe you like Prince or Michael Jackson, one of them coats right there, this is nice. <laughs> And somebody stole that coat. It's yours. They stole it. You know it's yours. And it's this little kid on the corner. Nine years, ten years old. And he got your coat. He's sporting it. You see him on the corner. He just done, you know, doing little poses. You're not going to walk up to him and ask him for your coat. Because it's yours. You're going to demand that he give you back what belongs to you. That's how the enemy robs people. He makes people hesitant about what God has already given them. And the fight is different. See, when you, get, when you go after something that you know God has already given you, your fight is different. Now, if you weren't sure now, you know, well, it kind of looked like my coat, but I don't want to go over there and start no problem. Well, I don't know. Maybe it is. I'm like, no, 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 no. You know for a fact. You going over there with boldness. Might snatch the joke up out your coat. I know I would, in the name of Jesus. I know I'm <laughs> but that's the veracity. That's the, that's, that's the way in which you would approach the situation. That's why we need to walk by revelation. Some people don't have that revelation. And so they're timid in their approach to what it is that God has given them, to what the promises of God has allotted them. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 25. Still talking about trusting in God. Still talking about appropriating the word of God. Here is Jesus talking. Jesus answered, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Everything that we do for God should bear witness to Jesus. Everything that we do for God should bear witness of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to bear witness to you. 
I want to make your name great. But ye believe me not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. It's cut and dry. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. There's an intimacy. That's why the true way to obtain everything that there is in God is through intimacy. Because there's not a scripture for husbands, there's not a scripture for wives, there's not a scripture for jobs, there's not a scripture in the Bible that says go over there and pray for that person. No, we have to be led by the Spirit on that. We have to know when and when not God is calling us to do a particular thing in regards to the promises of God. We have to remember that sometimes God will call us to something that's a blessing for someone else. We think that it's all about us. Oh, we've been in positions where we thought that God was doing something else. In actuality, God was actually working his plan. And his plan was strategically to help somebody else, to minister to somebody else. So here is Jesus saying, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them me, get, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. No one is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. That's a promise from God. That's a promise for security. There's a promise for protection in the name of Jesus. And it's an illustration of where the intimacy lies. I is in the, and if you go to another portion of scripture, he says, I pray that they shall be in me as we are to, as we are one. I pray that they be one as we are one. Talking about the body of Christ, but also talking about us in the spiritual realm as the body of Christ. We are one. Joshua Chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Going back a little bit. Starting at verse 1. I have given. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that when the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister saying, my servant Moses is dead. Now therefore rise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I will give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, I have given you. Goes again. As I said unto Moses, he's perpetuating a promise. It's a generational blessing. We talk about generational curses. We can talk about generational blessings. There are some things that we can pass on to our children that have nothing to do with land, houses, money, or jewelry. It's our demonstration of our walk with God. I look back at some of the people who I didn't know were teaching me without words on how to walk with God. My grandmother and, and other, my aunts and uncles and things of that nature who were in the Lord, they, they demonstrated unto me how to walk with God. From the wilderness into in this Lebanon, even unto the great river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. God gave them borders. In fact, the Israel that stands today, the borders are much broader. If you go back and you look at the original boundaries of what God gave Israel, much, much larger. But they're still dwelling in a land that which God gave them, and they gave them borders. He hath given. There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of my life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with. Put your name in the blank. As 
I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Watch this. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Watch what he says. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do all the law. Of course, we're under grace, but it's still the same principle. To be obedient to the Holy Spirit, to be obedient to God. Which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right or to the left. And then it gives a conjunction, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Some people are wondering why is it not working the way that I heard it from God? Because you turn to the right or to the left. Sometimes God causes us to be in seasons where we're waiting on him. That's not a time to get impatient and turn to the right or to the left. That's why we was distinct in his promise. He said, listen, I'm going to give you this. Every place that you shall put your, your feet in is going to be yours. And everything that I've promised your fathers is yours. He says, but turn not from the right hand or to the left according to the words that I've spoken to you. The word of God, the instruction. So now he hasn't given me any new instruction. It's just like a GPS and it's buffering. God allows things to buffer sometimes. You had a street at a corner and it's buffering and you don't know which way to go. Well, it looked like I could go left and you end up in the wrong part of town. And God is saying, I got you buffering on purpose. Stay right there. You don't know whether or not I got you buffering because I need you. Somebody to walk past your car that I have a, a, a mission for you. And you move from where God has you. God says, I'm in control of the GPS. I'm in control of the internet. I'm in control of all of that stuff. I'm causing it to buffer on, a, on, on purpose. What do we do when life buffers on us? Feel like we sit and still, but actually we're at in, right in the middle of the will of God. You're never idle in Jesus. You're never idle. You're never stuck. You're, we're, we're never at a point to where God is getting us uh, 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 in a point of a standstill. There's no standing still in God. God always does purpose. Sometimes when God is not working on things for us, God is working on us. People say, I won't pray for patience, but God says, no, I'm going to give you patience. I'm going to give you situations just like the person that's built up here and they're standing on 11 o'clock. He said, I know you need some leg strength. So guess what? I'm going to give you some leg exercises. I know you don't like it. I know it's not comfortable, but it's necessary for where I got you going. I've already given you what I'm ushering you into, but the one mistake that sometimes people think that God is going to usher them into something that they're not ready for. We think we're ready sometimes. Lord, I'm ready. I said that before. Lord, I'm ready. Lord, I got the memo. I've been here long enough. Just go ahead and bring me on it. Open them double doors. He's like, no. My ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your way. In other words, my understanding of the situation is way beyond what you could possibly comprehend. You're limited. You're finite. You have a limited view of what I'm trying to do. That's one of the mistakes sometimes. That's the struggle sometimes. Oh, it don't feel good when God says, I want to break you of your ability. I want to break you of the tendency to have to understand what I'm doing all the time. Can you just trust me? I gave you the, I've, I've given it to you now. I need you to stand on the fact that I've given to you. Don't try to figure out how I'm going to bring it to pass. And if I'm not bringing it to pass in the way that you think I should, or in the speedily manner that you think I should, I still need you to wait on me while you're buffering. Do we trust God while we're buffering? Lord, I've been at this stoplight a long time. Lord, I've been at this corner. I've been down this road. I've, listen, it look like I've encircled the block, the same block. I've been seeing the same tree. Don't look like I'm going nowhere. And God is like, yes, you are. 
The enemy is telling you you're not going anywhere. The enemy is telling you that it's not working. The enemy is telling you that you had a standstill. The enemy is telling you that you're stuck. You're progressing in the way that I want you to in the time that I want you to. I'm walking you right into blessings. And when it, when the, when you finally get there, you're going to say, oh, man, you ever look back and you say, but now, now you know, but now that makes sense. That, now you know what that did. It made sense while I was going through it, but now it does make sense. God is saying, I want you to have perfect peace at all times. The peace is not when you can look back and say, wow, I see how it makes sense. No, the peace is when you buffer it. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. I don't know why I'm at this corner, but I trust the one who got me at this corner. I trust the one who's got me on the GPS. Verse 8. This book shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all I say all with the law, all that is written therein, not a little bit, not some parts, not just the parts that I like, not just the parts that make me feel good. No, all of that stuff. When you're disciplining yourself on a workout regimen, there's some stuff that you might not like. There's some stuff that we did. No, Lord, I don't, I don't know about this part. You got me dealing with this difficult person right here, and you're talking about I, I, I need to, I need to, I need to talk to this person more. I need to be around this individual a little bit more because there's something that you're working in me that this person is drawing out. Yeah. For then I shall make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So the way to be prosperous, and this is not just talking about financially, because God will definitely do that, but the way to be prosperous, I pray that you prosper as your soul prosper. So in other words, I want to be uh, more fruitful. I want all of the fruit of the Spirit to be operating in my life. They're there because when you're born again, he gives you the Spirit, and all of the fruit of the Spirit are there. It's just a matter of exercising them. Paul said, I die daily. In other words, in any time, your, your flesh is a fruit suppressor. The fruit of the spirit is trying to come out. The fruit of the spirit of temperance, is, is which, which is basically patience, is trying to come out when that person cuts you off at the tra traffic light. And the fruit of the spirit is like, just remain calm. Don't, don't flip nothing at them when you drive by. Don't run them down and, and, and go off on them. Don't do, do none of that, that. The Holy Spirit is always trying to get us to exercise the fruit. And what is that flesh doing? Hmm. You better go on down to who they think they are. They almost ran you off the road. They could have you. could have hit you. Go on, take vengeance. No. I got to observe all that is written therein. Then I shall make my way prosperous. And then I shall have good success. Patience is not the ability to wait. Everybody got the ability to wait. We can stand in line. I can stand in line at Walmart and be cussing and complaining all the way. That's not patience. Patience is not, well, I've been in this line and I can't believe this. And I, don't, I, don't, I just can't. I just, look at her. She, she got all that stuff and she don't even know what she want to do. She got, no, that's not patience. Patience is my attitude while I'm waiting. That's the test. God is saying, no, no, no. I'm, I'm looking at what you're saying, what you're doing, how you're acting while I have you buffering. Do you have that same joy? Do you have that same peace? Are you still willing to do the work of the Lord while you're waiting on the Lord, while I have you buffering? And it seems like sometimes this is what the enemy will do. When God has you buffering, it seems like everybody is driving by. Everybody is moving forward. Oh, that person is doing this and that person is doing that. And he, 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 he advancing them. And Lord, how could you bless this person? And how could you do that? And how could you turn it around for them? And God is like, really? I like what he told the laborer in the vineyard when he brought one person in at the last hour. Right. He said, this is my vineyard. Right. <laughs> you agreed to work for a penny, right? So what you got to do with whether or not that person been working 16 hours or you've been working the whole 24? Mm -hmm. You agreed to work for a penny, right? Mm -hmm. This is my vineyard, right? Blinders. Because the enemy seeks to distract us when we're buffering, and it seems like other people are just driving by through life. And God is saying, no, I got a perfect plan for you. Do you trust me for the plan that I have for your life? Do you really? 
Do you know what I've given you? Because if you know that I, what I've given you and you trust me, then the experience of where I'm taking you is going to be so much better. Your blood pressure going to go down just 20%, 30 45%. <clears throat> One of the things while we're trusting God, and even at a point to where we're buffering, we can't talk to everybody. You can't. Joshua 6, still in the same chapter of, of where we started. Joshua chapter 6, verse 10. Joshua 6, verse 10. And Joshua commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout then ye shall then shall ye shout wait a second Joshua why do you have to be quiet because you got to think about what God just asked them to do he asked them to walk around Jericho I'm supposed to possess it and everything that's in it and the regiment for me possessing it is to march around six times and on the seventh day, seven times, then blow the horn. Somebody out of the bunch, you can guarantee would have been like, man, this crazy. This don't make no sense. Why are we doing this? Man? See, sometimes when you do, when you, when you, when you align, when you're, when you're, when you're going through and you align yourself with what it is that God has called you to do, to some people that may seem foolish. So instead of opening your mouth and telling them what season you're in, it's just best to be quiet and not let anybody know or let the people that you trust or the people that you're touching and agreeing with know so that you can continue to walk out the process. Because carnal folk will say, you crazy. You praying over your man. That man, that man ain't going to change. Girl, you know, you better, you better do like that. Oh, you praying over your finance? You, now you know the economy. You know gas, gas about to go up another two, three dollars. It's gonna get hard out here. You know God ain't. But you waiting on what? You got, <laughs> man, listen, man, listen. I, I, I know what you're doing and everything like that, and I know that you know what I'm saying. And it, it, but the, the world is we were operating in the, in the, in the natural realm. So you, you, all that stuff you talking about praying and and you trying no, 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 keep your mouth shut, closed. We have to keep our mouth shut. This is what the Holy Spirit gave me. Stop looking for an amen from people on what God told you. We look for a second. If God told you to do it, if nobody else says amen, if nobody else understands, listen, God told me to go to this corner, set up a tent, and stand out here and preach the gospel. And they say, well, you look foolish. I don't care. It's specific to you. And sometimes people's opinions will clash with God's word. Our problem is trying to have a spiritual conversation with carnal and fleshly people. You don't need man's amen to confirm what God told you. When you're close to your breakthrough is when you need the most discipline. They were right there at the promised land. And God gave them a crazy set of circumstances, crazy set of instructions in the natural. Look at what he told Naaman. Dip yourself in the Jordan. That nasty, filthy... I know y'all got a baptismal pool or something around here. Y'all, I mean, that, <laughs> people bathe and they use the restroom. And I mean, come on now. No, you want your healing. That's it right there. That's God's, but people come along. You ain't got... It don't take all that. You ain't got to do that. You ain't got to pray all that. You ain't got to be taking all through your house. and No, you ain't got to do that. that, that uh, no, that, that, no, 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 no. You got to do what God told you to do. I trust what God has given me enough to trust the instructions that God gave me in order to obtain what he's given me. God gave us things. But then there's instructions on how to obtain what it is that God has given us. He told them that the Jericho was theirs. 
But before you go in, march around it six times, and then on the seventh day, march around seven times, and then shout, blow the trumpet, all those different things. I thank God that they were obedient to that. Exodus chapter 14, because we look at <clears throat> children of Israel were tested in so many ways. When their first test. <clears throat> Exodus 14 <clears throat> verses 13 <clears throat> Exodus 14 verse 13 and 14 verse Red Sea moment Pharaoh pursuing <clears throat> pressing moment the pressure is on Sometimes breakthrough brings pressure because the enemy is wanting you to throw on the towel at the very last possible moment. The enemy is wanting you to give up at the last very possible moment. And Moses said unto the people, fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today Ye shall see them again no more forever. It's the promise of God. Fear not and stand still. Fear not, stand still. Fear not, stand still. The tendency is to always do. Because he's given it to me. So then the tendency is to think, well, if, if, if he's given it to me, then no matter what I do, I'm still going to get it. No. I have to align myself with the word of God, with this instruction, with this voice. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. Verse 14, it says, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Amen. Even when opposition arises, the tendency is to defend ourselves, to fight for ourselves, to Take up for ourselves. God said, don't even take up for yourself. Can you imagine that? Jesus was our example. Jesus was being crucified. He was about to be cru it wasn't so much that he was about to be crucified. It was the accusations. The accusations were false. But he never tried to defend. He never tried to say, y'all lying on me. Y'all did this. I didn't do that. He never tried, he never tried to do none of that. Jesus said, listen, I'm, my father, he going to do the fighting. The Lord shall fight for you. <clears throat> Hold your peace. That's another fruit of the Spirit. Temperance again. I got to be able to hold my peace. Even when what it is that you're doing, the obedience that you're maintaining gets criticized. Have you been being, just being obedient to God? And people criticize, girl, you're a fool. Boy, you're stupid. You soft. I just I, somebody talked to me like that. I'm sorry. I, I just got to let you like no. You you you're operating in the love of God. Jesus was the strongest person that ever stepped foot on this earth, and he was meek. He spoke the truth, but he always spoke the truth in love. Love needs no defense. He even told the people, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now that's some power for you. Somebody put you, about to nail you in the cross, slap, putting crown of thorn on your head. I wouldn't be trying to say, Lord, forgive them for I'd be like, strike them down, Lord, and then let the ground open up like you did the children. Of that's what, because <laughs> your flesh, you'd be like, in the name of Jesus, the wrath of God be upon you. You see, but Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. The ability to hold one's peace is strength. That's strength. You ever see people, oh man, you, well, that girl right there, she got it. She got that boldness. And she, no, 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 no. Sometimes boldness is weakness because we got to tell somebody off every time. That's not, that's not self-control. Self-control is strength. Verse 15, and the Lord said unto Moses, <clears throat> Why criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel 
that they go forward. See, Moses, even though he had the staff and even though he had seen, he had called down all of these plagues and he had seen God's power work through him, he was still perplexed. God is saying, you already know what to do. I've already given you a battle strategy. I've already told you that praise and worship work. I've already told you that to plead the blood of Jesus. I've already showed you what the word of God does. I already told you what to do. Why are you crying to me about something that I've already empowered you to do? Sometimes we cry to God and God's like, really? Moses, you, you, all of my wonders, all of the, all of the things that I've done, but lift out the rod and stretch out thy hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall grow, shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. I call it don't pick, don't, don't hit the panic button. You can't always hit the panic button. We got to sometimes step back and say, okay, God, maybe there are some things that you weren't necessarily prepared for. You get hit with some news or you get hit with something and there's an opportunity. The enemy wants you to panic. But God is like, no, I've already given you what it is that I've given you. Even though the enemy is presenting a set of facts to you that says that it's contrary, I don't need you to panic when something else happens. I've seen people praying for healing and then the doctor says, oh, it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I, I didn't already told you I, I'm going to heal. What you crying to me for? Yeah. Keep pleading the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Keep putting the anointing on. Keep speaking the word of God over the situation. We get it, oh, no, what, what's going to happen? No. I already promised you, if I said I'm going to take care of you, it shouldn't matter how many bills coming out. It shouldn't matter how that bank account looks. I told you I was going to take care of you. Why are you crying to me? Moses, I told you I'm taking you to the promised land. I told you I'm going to take care of you. And so God is like, do you trust me? Just like the boy in the picture who was running to jump into the arms of his father, there was a level of trust there to know that my daddy's going to catch me. No matter which way it happens, daddy's got you covered. He's going to catch you. You're not going to fall. The enemy would like to present you with images of a cracked skull, a fractured leg, and everything. You, know, you cannot jump out there. That's a, that's a little far to jump now. You might. No, my daddy's arms are strong enough. He's sure enough. And he's never failed me. He's never failed me yet. That's a song. We have come this far by faith. So now, if you have to understand it, it's not faith. If you have to understand it, it's not faith. Romans 8.28, <clears throat> very familiar text. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we know, not we think, we feel like it. See, a lot of times what happens is we... We point to the good things that happen and we say, oh, that's the, that's the moment when we get that unexpected check. Oh, all things work together for the good. Glory be to God. When, when something happens and, and we get blessed with something or somebody miraculously gets healed or somebody gets delivered or somebody gets, they turn their life over to the Lord. All things work together for the good. But then when something that doesn't look good happens, we're silent. We don't quote Romans 8.28. Because we don't understand that part. I understand the blessing part, the deliverance and the healing and the unexpected check. But this part right here, Lord, I don't know if I can shout like that right there. Now, now all things work together. Didn't say that all things were good. But he says that I need you to trust me enough to know that it's all working together for your good. It's working together for your good. I, 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 I want to break you of this. And he had it still working in me on this. I, I'm not there. I got to break you of your 
tendency to want to always understand. And what that means is it goes back to the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Wanting to have it all figured out. Wanting to know something that's, uh, that you see all of these people that are going to soothsayers and to them, whether it's uh, the, the, the tarot cards or whether it's the, 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 uh, the, what are the, the, the signs that people, the Taurus and the, all this other kind of stuff. People are trying to find out what's going to happen tomorrow. When the God who holds tomorrow is saying, I'm standing right here. All you need to do is put your full trust in me. If we look at the Bible and we turn to Revelations at the last chapter, we see that it all works out for us. So even now in the in-between part, I have to break myself of wanting and desiring to understand everything that God is doing at all times. That's why he's God and we're not. He's God and we're not. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God to them who are the call according to his purpose. <clears throat> Joshua. <clears throat> Back to Joshua. Chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 22, Joshua 6, 22. But Joshua said unto the two men that had spies, so let me give you a little backdrop. They did what they were obedient. The wall fell down flat before them. They went in to possess the land. There was a harlot named Rahab. When they went to spy out the land, the people got wind of it, just giving you a paraphrase 2021 type version and they were looking for these spies. They was going to get them. And so now, because of Rahab's faithfulness, they said, okay, we're going to go in and to destroy this land, but we're not going to we're going to spare Rahab, who was a harlot, whore, and her household. She said, they're not here. They came looking for them. She says, they're not here. And so because of her willingness to protect the men and women of God, or the men of God, rather, they protected her in saying, let's get her out. And so this is what's happening right now. But Joshua said unto the two men that had spied <coughs> out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. <coughs> And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had and brought her and brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. <clears throat> and they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelled in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And Joshua acquired them at the time, saying, Cursed be the man therefore before excuse me, curse be the man before the Lord that rises up and build this city of Jericho. He said, if you try to build it up again, you curse. <clears throat> he shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn. And his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua in his fame was noise throughout all the country. I bring up Rahab because understanding is not faith. We look at all of these people up here, and sometimes we have the tendency to look at people where they are and think that they cannot be used of God. On, Trusting God. Trusting God. Here is Rahab the harlot who ends up being the great-grandmother of David, who's in the lineage of Jesus. So here's a harlot who is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. 
And I know that God poetically, poetic justice, did that on purpose to show that everybody can be used of God. So the next time that we're looking at some gangbangers or some dope dealers or somebody with, with a long blunt in their mouth or the woman on the corner, I look at the people sometimes when they come through to the events, I say, what treasures lie underneath all of that stuff? What things that God is desiring to do with the things that man has cast off is unusable, is undesirable. Oh, she's just a whore. Or oh, she, he's just a, 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 what we would call a bum on the street. No, God desires to use those same people. But we try to understand. We see that that's why I got a problem sometimes when pastors say, Well, no, nah, I'm not going out there. I, I, what do you mean you're not going out there? Jesus said, I'll go after the one. Yeah, yeah we can preach to the 99, build them up so that they can go out. But God said, Go after the ones. Because it's the ones that God desires to use. And sometimes we're praying for a long time. For those people. <clears throat> Rahab was a great grandmother of David. God chooses to use what? I put what, what? He wills <laughs> to bring about his will. Who would have thought? <laughs> a harlot, be Israel, in the birth of Christ. Stop trying to figure out what God is doing and just be obedient. This thing we got called our, our, our natural mind, our, our mind, our will, and our understanding can be our worst enemy. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened with Moses, Moses, the first thing Moses reasoned with, with God, when God had already told him, I'm, I'm choosing you to do this, is I'm not eloquent of speech. I, who am I? Lord? Who, I I'm, I'm going to go to Pharaoh. I ain't, I'm not nobody. And God says, no, I, it's not because you're somebody. It's because of who I am. Yes. It's not because of anything other than because of who I am. And I'll take the foolish things of this world. I'll take the Rahabs of this world to confound the wise. So the next time that you're ministering to someone, you could be ministering to an evangelist. You could be giving clothes or food to an evangelist that will speak to nations. That's why when we pray for people, that's the other thing. Praying over people. Oh, yeah, we're going to give you some clothes. We're going to give you some food, but we're going to pray over you because your destiny, that same evangelist might be the same one that preaches to your granddad, your, your grandfather, your grandchild, or your son or your daughter. That same evangelist might be the tent revival that leads your loved one to Christ. How important was it to minister to them, to build them up, to let them know God can use you? We say that in cliche, but be really mean and really believe it. God can use you. I don't, I don't have to understand what it is that you're in right now. I don't have to know what it is that you're in right now. I can pray over you and know that God is able to use you. People are looking for people to believe in. And we watched a movie here recently. <coughs> Venus and Serena Williams story. And it was a very impactful movie. I look at spiritual implications in it all the time. So here's his father in Compton. Compton was rough. Matter of fact, he got beat up twice by some, some gang members who was trying to basically holler at his daughters in their teens. Got beat up real bad a couple of times. <clears throat> The neighbor, the, the, his neighbor across the street, she didn't like the way that he was being hard on the girls, so they called DCF or whatever you would call it back then to try to get something done to him, and he was just basically trying to see his girl's potential be fully materialized. He saw in them at a young age what they had, even amidst their circumstances, even amidst... Some kids, you can, you can recognize a gift at a young age. And these two young girls, they, they, had a talent, they had a talent at a young age. And some of the things that I didn't know that they were going through, some of the things that I didn't know that he did, he said he made sure that they had straight A's, even though they were doing the practices. But one of the things that he kept telling them, you're going to be the greatest in the world. You're going to be the people, 
People are going to be talking about you. Your name is going to be written uh, all over the newspapers and everything. Like You're going to be great. He kept telling them that, even amidst everything that they were going through. And there was a part of the movie where Venus was about to take off. She was in her teens, 11, 12, 13 years old. She's already a prodigy. And the people wanted Venus because she was the older one, and Serena was the youngest, and Serena was still in some type of way. He said, you're going to surpass your sister, which happened. He said, you're going you're gonna to win even more than her. He said, I, I, I kept you in the shadow because I knew your brilliance, your greatness, and I'm just going to, you know, we, you, you'd like to surprise. So at 15 years old, signs a contract. The first contract she signed, and this was a testament, and I'm, I'm still talking about trusting God because it all ties in with this purpose and plan. The very first contract they came to this girl with, we didn't know, they, of course, moved to $3 million. You're talking about a family that's living in the projects, mm -hmm. shooting and everything like that. And so, I wanna say she had to be like 13 or 14 at the time, and the daddy said, no, nah, you got to negotiate with her. And so, you would think, well, she's a child, but then there was a spiritual implication. What he had instilled in her, he was confident that she was ready to negotiate with a big name company like Nike. She was ready. He says, I know she's ready because of what I put inside of her, what I've instilled in her. I don't need to talk no more. God is getting you to the point to where he's been still so much in you that he's going to rush you to the, oh my God. He's putting us in situations where he says, now it's time for you to do it. And so the daughter this is not what teen, what what fourteen or thirteen year old wouldn't look at wouldn't look at three million dollars and say where do I sign? But because of what our daddy put on the inside of her, she says no. Paraphrasing what she said, I know I'm gonna be worth that more than that once they see me play on the pro circuit. She had that type of wisdom, and so guess what? She played. She lost her first match because you know what I'm saying she hadn't played in a little while. But then she she she. Of course, her fame grew, and at 15 years old, Reebok signed a contract with her for $12 million. 15. <laughs> I said all that to say this. Our Father has placed some things on the inside of us. Our Father has given us some things. But then he's also given us the wisdom to know when to take what we need to take and when not to. She knew, no, this is not the contract. I'll wait for it to come to me. Sometimes we look at an opportunity. No, this is not the opportunity. I'll wait for the opportunity to come to me. No, this is not the time. I'll wait for the time to arrive. Because sometimes even when we're witnessing and ministering to people, the Bible says that he'll give us an in-season word for someone who is weary. In season, I can speak the right word in the wrong season and it do more harm than good. I can speak the right word in the right season and it flourish and bring a hundredfold increase. So Lord, even though it's the right thing to say, is it the right season? Is this the right time? Is this the right moment? If not, I need the, the ability, Lord God, to be obedient, to close my mouth and continue to do what it is that you've told me to do. Continue to pray for those individuals. Continue to, 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 to go before the throne and intercede for them. Talking about people who got children. Children that, that may be out there in the world, that may be out there looking like all of this stuff. God, I'm still going to use them. Don't you let the enemy lie to you and tell you that because they've been going through these perpetual cycles, running their head in the ground, that I don't have a perfect plan and a purpose for their life. But I need you to not understand why they're continuing to do what it is that they're doing. Even amidst all the showering of prayers, I need you to understand the buffering moment. I had a buffering moment. County jail slowed me down. Didn't receive Christ at an altar at a church. Didn't receive him on a Sunday or a Wednesday. No. County jail. People didn't even understand. Mom, dad, why is this happening to my son? Why is this going on? Because God saw this day. 
Y'all don't know what I'm trying to do to this boy. Y'all don't know what I got to take him through in order to get him to the point to where he is right now. See, we look at the road. We look at the highway. We look at all of these different things. Lord, this don't make sense. Save him in the way that I think he should be saved. Let him walk through the doors one day and just cry. Let him call me one night with tears in his eyes. No, I'm going to take that joker through some mud, some dirt, some places that if you had to put your hand in it, you would have said, no, that's too harsh. No, that's too much. So I'm going to take it out of your hands and do what I want to do. I thank God. People look at me like I'm crazy when I say I thank God for everything that he took me through. Because I wouldn't know him like I know him. I wouldn't know him as a deliverer. I've been in car accidents that people say, how did you walk away from that? I could understand that testimony. When my mama go to the car, she in tears looking at her like, boy, you weren't supposed to walk away from that. I didn't understand, but God had a plan at that time. Understanding is not faith. Now that we know and now that God has given us revelation, even the things that they're in right now, as horrible as they may be, even the things right now that we say, oh, Lord, would you please stop them from doing that? No, God, deliver them through it. Sometimes snatching them out isn't deliverance because they ain't, bitten, they ain't hit their head against that wall hard enough. Amen. That wall needs to hurt before you to bring them out. That wall had to hurt. When that wall hurt, it hurt. Guess what? Deliverance. He ain't got to worry about me wanting to hang out with the dope boy. He ain't got to worry about me wanting to do any of that stuff. I remember how that wall, wall hurt. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith. What is that word? By faith. Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, moved with fear. By faith, moved with fear. By faith, we move. By faith, we move. Verse 8, Abraham, when he was called out to go into the place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went. Called out, not knowing whether he went, he obeyed. Amen. When he calls you out, we just have to obey. By faith, verse 9, he sojourned in the land of promise as a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles of Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the promise. By faith we move. By faith we move. Not by faith we have to understand. No, by faith we move. The Lord, help me to keep, just move. Help me to just do. Help me to just obey. Because ultimately, I'm called to trust you. That's what we're called to do. Trusting God comes with an intimacy, just like we trust, whether it be wives, whether it be parents, whether it be siblings, whether it be uh, 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 family, whatever. Well, whoever it is, God is saying it. You, you do that because of the relationship. Think about that. Some stranger comes to you and says, hey, I need you to sign this because this is good for you and this, that, and that. You probably, you, hold on, wait, I don't know you. But if it's somebody that you trust, Sometimes you won't even read the paperwork because you trust that person. Sure, okay, it's good for me. You say it's good. I'm just on that side. You ain't got to explain it. You told me it's good. Okay. God is saying, I'm God. How much more? How much more 
Should you demonstrate that trust when I ask you to do something? When I've given you something and I'm giving you instructions on how to walk it out and how to obtain it.